I know that it is it's June and Easter was in April. But I'd like to revisit the Easter story. And uh, I mean, the reason that we have church on Sunday and, and not on Saturday is because of the resurrection. And, uh, and every Sunday we would proclaim and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And, and we could, we could read the Easter story every, every Sunday. But this is from John chapter 20. This is the first Easter. The first Easter morning. I invite you to, to follow along on the screen behind me or on your smartphones, tablets. There are blue books and pews called Bibles. If you'd like to follow along, or if you simply would like to listen. My life will come and go, your life will come and go, everything around us one day will fade. But that which we are about to hear is everlasting, and it is forever. So listen now. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple, now pause for a second, the other disciple is John. And, and this was this was his way of just putting his own authorship. Because he's writing it. So even though the Lord is, is inspiring him and speaking through him, uh, John wants us to, to let us know. There was there was comp just as there's competition today, uh, there was competition among the disciples. So not a coincidence that John would go, the other disciple, you know, the one that Jesus loved. Which is kind of like going when your kids go, who's your favorite? Is it me? I'm your favorite. And so that's John saying, uh, it's me. Verse 3, Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped in, looked in, and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary. You kind of, you know, you kind of feel like you pulled the mask down a little bit, just a little bit. So she turned to him and cried out, Rabbi, close enough. Okay, good. Which is Hebrew for teacher? Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God, to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. Walked through the locked door. You got it? You got it. Terrified, obviously, Jesus, the disciples were. So Jesus says, peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. So they told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe. I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, place my hand into the wound on his side. Now eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Wait for it. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Which is where we are. Not with Jesus walking among us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today we're talking about doubt and fear in our lives and our faith. Doubt is a problem. It's something. Maybe it's not a problem. It's not a problem. I'm going to say that. Doubt is something that we will all face at some point, before we can, as fully as we can on this planet, come to grips with our faith, we all have doubts and fears from time to time. The question is not if you have doubts, but it is a matter of when you're going to have doubts and fears. And then the question becomes, what do we do when we've got doubts about our faith? And the first thing that I would encourage you is, is to own up to the fact. You know, we, we, we could talk all the time about the Sunday morning facade that, that we've all probably been in a place where before we walk into church, you want to make sure that if your hair is just right, your flies up, you, you, know, you, you, you don't have broccoli in your teeth, and, and when someone asks you, hey, it's good to see you, how are you doing? If you're doing crummy, are you going to say, I'm doing crummy? Are you going to say, I'm doing good? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. In church, everything's good. Everything's... And, maybe, and maybe you just don't want to get into it right there, and, and I'll tell you. Sometimes people have said to me, Dustin, how, how are you doing? And I go, not really well this morning. And then it puts people on panic, so I've just decided to lie to people as well. <laughs> Or sometimes I'll say, I have a you ask me later, you know, or uh, I'm doing okay, or, you know, would you pray for me, and uh, so on and so forth. But, but part of that, I think, the facade of wanting to, you know, pretend that our lives are organized and in good shape is that when it comes to our faith, um, it's hard for us to say, I, I'm not sure what I think about this. I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. I don't know all 66 books of the Bible memorized. And, and uh, so maybe we, we wouldn't want to open the Bible because we wouldn't know where to find something. It has a table of contents. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to get plugged into a small group Bible study because we might be exposed that, that we're a newbie, that we're a novice, that, that our faith isn't where we think it should be. And that becomes an obstacle for us ever being able to grow. The first thing to do when you've got a doubt is to own up to it. Everybody has doubts and fears about their, their faith. If you spend any kind of time here on a Sunday morning or in conversation with me, people will ask me a question. They go, what's the deal with this? And there will be times where I say, I'm not really sure. There are some who say this, and there are some who say this, or, or one, of, you know, one of my taglines to get out of you know, a conversation is somebody go, well, what's, what's the deal with this in the Bible? And I'll say, God-fearing people, way smarter and more spiritual than me, have been arguing over that for hundreds of years. And I don't know. The first thing to do is to own up. It's dangerous to pretend that we never have doubts or fears. It becomes a 
with superficiality and our own spirituality. It becomes a superficiality in, in the way that we handle each other. Now, have you ever noticed that, that sometimes you know someone and we associate that person with what they do? There is, there is a comedian. He's, he's got his flannel shirt and no sleeves, and we call him Larry the... Yeah. Okay, good. You can right into that. His real name is Larry Whitney. But, but to me, his first name is Larry, his last name is Cable Guy, and his middle name is The. Right? Larry the Cable Guy. God bless you. In, in our house, there is Dora the... Very good. There's Bob the... There's Thomas the Tank. And there's Smokey the... Wow! Really? Oh, four for four, five for five. Okay, I got one. Remember the TV show, friends? Gunther the... Who said coffee shop guy? Winner! Give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. When uh, Gunther the coffee shop guy, for those of you who want to play along, and uh, good one. When I was finishing graduate school, I had to intern as a chaplain at the Tampa General Hospital, and I would walk into a room as a way, people get nervous when a doctor walks into a room, so I thought I would alleviate people's nerves, and I would walk into a room and say, hi, I'm Dustin the Chaplain. Sometimes I had the opposite effect, and uh, they would say, am I dying? No, no, I'm just here to pray for you. Uh, so I was Dustin the Chaplain. And, and then in the New Testament, in our story today, there's Thomas. He is not known as Thomas the Apostle. He's not known as Thomas the Servant of God. He is forever known as Thomas the Doubter. Doubting Thomas. Maybe someone has said to you at one point in time, don't be a doubting Thomas. Don't be such a doubting Thomas. People say it as if it's a bad thing. And I would like to introduce to you the idea this morning that I think Thomas has been given a bad rap all these thousands of years. Because there's more to the story of Thomas than just this one passage. But this is the passage that he's best known for. And why has doubt become a bad thing to have? In my experience, doubt leads to questioning, which leads to better understanding, which leads to a stronger faith. The first time that we meet Thomas in the scriptures is in the story of Lazarus. Jesus and his disciples have just returned to Galilee. They narrow escape being stoned to death in Jerusalem, and they heard of the death of their friend Lazarus. Jesus suggests to them that they return to Judea again to be with Mary and Martha and grieve. Some of the disciples try to talk him out of going back out of fear of being attacked. Jesus insists that they return. If only so that the disciples can see that Lazarus is really dead, regardless of the danger to them. Thomas, however, suggests that they go with Jesus. Let us go also, Thomas says, so that we might die with him. Doesn't sound like someone who had doubts. Here Thomas shows his understanding, the true cost of being a follower of Jesus. He understands that in being loyal and dedicated, it means that sometimes people might feel uncomfortable. It could cost him his life. In some parts of the world, uh, it is a life-threatening position to follow Christ. A risk that Thomas was willing to take for Jesus. Even though Thomas proved he was a loyal and dedicated disciple of Jesus, he still didn't always understand what Jesus was talking about. And I would say to you, that even if you don't always understand what Jesus is talking about, you can still follow Jesus. But Thomas wanted to understand. He wanted to learn more about this new way of living, the new way of being. So he asked questions when he didn't understand. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, the disciples had just finished their last supper together. After supper, Jesus starts telling them, what's going to happen? The crucifixion story. Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. But I will come again, and I will take you myself to be where I am, that you might be with me in heaven also. And you know the way to where I am going. Now we know for a fact as we read the New Testament that all the disciples were really confused at this point. They didn't 
quite understand that, that Jesus was going to be persecuted, that he was going to be tortured, that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to, to rise. And all of the disciples were confused. If you were in the room, if I was in the room, I would have been confused. And I don't know that in that moment that I would have wanted to be vulnerable or even honest and say, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly where you're going. And I don't know the way. If I don't know where you're going, how can I know the way to get there? But Thomas says to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. He's the one who speaks up. He says, I don't get it. I've got some questions. Let me be honest with you, Jesus. I don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? In John 14, 6, this is one of our stronger statements. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Thomas not said, I don't get it. I've got questions. I've got doubts. It was necessary. <clears throat> Thomas never pretended to understand because he was embarrassed by his own confusion. Instead, honestly, he asks for clarification. Jesus explained further. When Thomas didn't understand something, Probe. He questioned. He said something. If he felt discouraged, he said something. <clears throat> On the night of the resurrection, the disciples, minus Thomas, gathered in a locked room with Mary discussing what had happened. So Thomas doesn't get to see Jesus' appearance. You didn't get to see Jesus appear. kind of bizarre to think about. It's not something that happens every day. Somebody doesn't get tortured and killed and then three days later come back to life. It's not a common, as far as I know, it's not a common occurrence. It's only happened a handful of times. And how many times throughout history, lots, has someone said, I'm a God, and, and, and if I die, and when I die, don't worry, I'm going to come back. And there, were, there were Jesus imitators, historically afterwards, who made the same proclamation. Guess where they are? Dead. You and I didn't get that experience that the first disciples had on that Sunday night. And so I think that if we're willing to look inside and be honest, that there's probably a little bit of Thomas in all of us. That nagging voice that whispers, is that really true? Do you really think that's true? Maybe what if you're wrong? Maybe this is all just a waste of time. We desperately wish for proof. Proof that we can see, proof that we can touch. We want Jesus to show up and say, touch my hand. This is not a sign that your faith is weak. It's not something even that years of church attendance or reading the Bible can make disappear. Doubt is something that goes hand in hand with faith. Doubt <coughs> is courageous. Faith is courageous. It takes courage to affirm oneself as a person of faith with so many Friends and family members have abandoned faith. They want nothing to do with faith. They say it's antiquated, it's irre irrelevant. It takes courage to trust in the promises of God, the grace of God's presence when life seems to be anti-God, when life seems to be dark, when misfortune comes, when despair comes, when death comes. It takes courage to believe in what we cannot see, to trust in what we can't touch, to affirm what we cannot prove. And the courage doesn't rest in my strength alone. But on the same God, who whether I believe he's there or not, is there. Who continually calls, continually loves, continually saves, redeems, walking with us every step of the way. And if we were to step
step back and, and look at all of the, the written accounts and the support that we have in the New Testament actually happen. It takes more faith to believe it didn't happen than that it really did. To believe that there is, is no God, you've got to have quite a faith. I don't know what it is you have faith in. But you've got to be pretty trusting if you've got it all figured out. But when we look at the reliabilities of the scriptures, we look at, at the facts presented to us in the Old Testament, the stories confirmed over and over in the New Testament, when we look at the goodness of God in our own lives, past, present, you've got a story, perhaps, where you said, but for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Followers of God are naturally questioners. Followers of God, believers in God, want to continue to question and to study only because it brings a greater understanding of the faith. Believers ask questions because here's a quote, God is always greater than our ideas about God. What's the percentage of your brain that you use? Mine, mine is like 1%, yours is like 7 or 8, right? Let's not pretend, you know, that, that we're the smartest beings in this universe. We're the room. God is always greater than our ideas of God. Because the public world that faith lives in confronts it with challenges and contradictions that cannot be ignored. And isn't that what we're trying to do with our faith? Make sense of all this? Make sense of the ugliness in the world, the darkness, the chaos around us? Aren't we seeking to understand all the challenges, all the contradictions? Being doubting Thomas is not a bad thing in this world. It's anything, as it did for Thomas. It brings us closer to God, closer to understanding how to live the way that Jesus wants us to live. Maybe it's unfortunate that Thomas has been given such a bad reputation. Maybe it's a good thing that we want to look at his story. There's a quote from Matt Chandler, a new book that's come out that I haven't finished reading, so, so far what I've read is good, but this quote is good as well. Faith doesn't mean an absence of fear. It means facing our fears and trusting that God's goodness is greater. So in the post-Easter season, as we celebrate the risen Christ, I encourage you, be more like Thomas. Be honest with yourself and with God to understand more by asking questions. And maybe somebody says, we have no right to question God. We have no right to wrestle with doubts. We have no right to have fears about God and life. They might say that questioning is the mark of a non-believer. But I'm here to say to you today that just like Thomas, when we sincerely look for God in the midst of our doubts, that's where we find faith. So go on. Be a doubting Thomas. Let's pray. Gracious God, in our hearts, deep down inside, we know that you are real. We know that you are here. We hope that you are real and that you are here. As you have given us faith, would you grow that faith? Would you help us this morning and always to be honest with you about our doubts, about our fears, hoping that you will continue be with us, to love us, especially because of our honesty. Our heart's desire is to know you, to grow in you, and so would you continue to walk with us and show us the way to a deeper faith. Guide our lives, bless our lives, show us the way that we ought to go and we to follow you. This is our prayer in the name of our Savior Christ.